Core X Revenge has been one of the most hotly contested things I've seen added to the game in any period of time, and I could totally understand why. It's very different than anything else the game has ever really had since the early days, and a lot of people just aren't in it for the right reason. So today I'm going to give you guys a full guide on everything that I know, at least that you need to know about Core X Revenge in this AV experience. We're going to talk about things like NPC placements, event and objective placements, and how they work the best way that you could operate within the battleground. And we're also going to kind of dive into the best way you could maximize your EXP per hour. We're going to talk about the best way to get the mount now that they made changes to that. And just overall, everything you need to know about operating within this AV experience, because it's very different than what you might realize. And a lot of people are probably in here for the first time. So let's get started. So one of the first things you'll notice as you get into AV is that you'll be gaining about 3% of a level every two minutes. That's the general consensus. I've not actually done the math on all the different character splits, and there's a lot of talk about low-level characters not operating very well within this battleground, but we are going to test that out as well and do this uh, on this video too. Yeah, as soon as you enter a fresh battleground, you're going to see a lot of quests. A lot of them have been made daily, so I don't necessarily, there's, you see the trickle experience, we got 20,000. You don't necessarily uh, want these to be daily. I'm not sure exactly, you know, you can read the blue post on why they changed it. Makes sense to me. First thing you can do is get that quest and come on over here to pick up some of the other ones. It's gonna recommend going here to the Quartermaster as Alliance. And this experience uh, is very small, but you know, it's worth it, 11K. Um, it's less than uh, the 20K that we're getting. So yeah, it's about probably one and a half percent. But still, if that's daily, you can do that every day and get a small amount of experience. Now, these few guys here as Alliance, luckily, uh, they're all very compact. Everybody's very close to each other. But this is the person who gives the famous quest for the mines. They no longer give, um, you can capture a mine for um, stuff, but they no longer give anything that you'd actually want for the mount and I don't believe they give experience either let's see uh, yeah they don't actually give experience anymore either so now even though they made these daily or you know they basically just removed the, the stuff that they used to give so it's not as important for getting the mount it's not as important for getting experience but it is still something that you're gonna want to do and I'm gonna explain to you why here but anyway, this is another famous one, Empty Stables. Both Horde and Alliance obviously have a quest like this. It basically uh, wants you to go get 25 rams. So that's the number people keep talking about. Uh, you can only do it for so long. It not, has nothing to do with it. It's when you get 25 rams and 25 wolf hides taken to this guy. So this guy wants the wolf hides. This guy wants the rams. This chick wants the rams. When you get 25 rams and 25 wolf hides, you have now completed the requirements to summon the cavalry. And we'll talk about that hopefully later in the battle. But for now, we're going to talk a little bit about how the mines work. So once you get... Uh, it's difficult to say because it's basically like a bar imagine like there's a bar that fills up uh, unfortunately this is classic wow effectively so there is no bar but you could kind of gauge how it's progressing based on this so the guy says we barely have any excess supplies it'll take a lot more work before we're ready i believe there's three different dialogues here so this one meaning you're less than a third of the way through the next one meaning you're at least a third of the way through probably about halfway through and then the final one means you're basically done so uh, at that point once you have completed it and, and, and again the way you complete it is by turning in both of these the cold tooth mine is the horde one okay so if you're alliance that's the far one and the iron deep supplies is the close one so the actual math needed here is that you need between a combination of some 30 trips from whatever the close mine is if horde obviously it's uh, cold tooth if alliance it's one here iron deep or five from the enemy mine so it's 10 boxes per you turn it in and it just progresses this bar like i say just try to think of it uh, if you are you know a very agile class and you can get down there without much competition from the horde obviously this is the fastest way to do it but before everybody was doing it for the mount and that is no longer a viable option but it was actually a good thing that people were doing it for the mount even though a lot of people were complaining about it because what it was doing was it was filling up this bar without any effort and that allowed you to then finish the order for a ground assault which if you've played alliance you will know it has been absolutely overpowered so if you have the full thing we will probably show this in the video at some point you have the full thing you're able to talk to him over here this guy here norig stormpike okay uh, the quartermaster sends you to this guy even though again there's no quest or indication on the map you just have to know where this guy is norg stormpike right here you would talk to him and he would actually say uh you know if you could he would tell you to go to the field and find the guy who is going to do the actual assault and that would take place right around here we'll show that in the video at some point but 
Either way, that's where Norg Stormpike is in case people are having trouble finding him. Now, if you're purely here for experience per hour, I got a little trick for you. It's a little scummy, but these mobs, as you see, give a lot of experience. And this is, of course, with Rested, but it's pretty easy to level multiple characters through this, so you might often be seeing a lot of Rested. If you have a lot of Rested, I think this is the best way to supplement your experience. As we already said, you get about 3% of a level per two minutes without any interaction. You don't even have to, literally you don't even have to participate in any way as you see 20,000 experience right there. So these mobs on their own are gonna be giving me almost, uh, yeah, about you know 10% of that or more. Um, depending on uh, you know what level you are. It's been a variant, again, there's a lot of variants here so it's difficult to say uniformly. But um, if you're looking only to level and you want to maximize the best way to do that, I would recommend going into these caves here. Now, there's one here for the Alliance. It's a Harpy's Den. These mobs are actually not the best to fight because a lot of them are casters. So it's very difficult to group a lot of them up. If you are very serious about this, you can literally just run in here and aggro about 100 of them. Uh, and then there's also one for a Horde, which hopefully will show. It's just off to the right of the keep, uh, well, you know, the main area for the Horde and uh, it's gnolls, there's gnolls there, okay? Now there's also stuff in the middle, which we will show, but either way, there's a lot of NPCs that you could actually fight here. And this is not the only reason to come to this cave. So people might be thinking, why is this even here? It is actually a quest that you can get from Hillsbrad Foothills, uh, you know, where the event actually takes place, of course, in uh, the lore. Um, there's two caves in Hillsbrad as well, which you'll notice on the map. This is the Horde one, and this is the Alliance one, and these are both the entrances, quote-unquote, to the battle. Uh, the old days, you used to have to actually enter from the old, uh, you know, the actual instance entrances. There was stuff there that you had to go and do, and there are still quests in front of these for both uh, Horde and Alliance. Now, they're technically for the regular AV, but they seem to work perfectly for this AV. And the main one you want to get is one that allows you to come and get a banner from the back of the cave. So if you had the quest here, the flag would be, you would just click it, then you'd have to turn it in outside the battleground back where we showed. And the good thing about that is it gives you this trinket, which is actually extremely powerful for this battleground, as a lot of the battles can be so protracted. The Stormpike Insignia, and it levels up based on your rep with the faction. So the more rep you have, the more rep levels you have, you can do another quest, you can do subsequent quests to get more ranks in the Insignia. And each time it gives you the same experience as the first quest did. So another thing that you'll also notice in here is that there's mining nodes. Now, another great way to maximize your experience in this battleground is to be a miner. Of course, if you're level 120 or whatever, you're close to 120, you're not gonna get a lot of experience for mining these nodes. But so you see, I only got 44 experience and that's because I'm very high level. I'm actually about to ding 116. So a great way to level uh, lower level characters, like if you're 60 to 80, you'll probably get a lot of value out of this cave. But another thing to bring up about this cave and something else that might need to be applied through the entire battleground is that you are all together in this. Everybody in this instance of AV is all in one group. And even though uh, these people are so far away, they might actually get a share of what I'm doing right now. So it's important to notice that if there's people anywhere near where you are, they will share the experience. And at times we've noticed this to great uh, detriment. I've seen people, I don't know if they're AFK or maybe they're in stealth or something like that, but I'll just be in this cave and I'll be getting extremely little experience. And that's just because somebody is sharing it with you. So if you were extremely scumbag, you could just come in here and AFK if somebody else was leveling in here and you would be getting half of their experience. For some reason, there's an elite Yeti in this cave. There's one in the Horde as well. I have no idea why it's here, but it gives a lot of experience, as do all elites in this battleground. So if you can do a situation where you have at least one other person, or you know, you might be able to survive it on its own, killing these elites and some of the ones that we'll show shortly are a very, very good way to level quickly. So if you're very serious about PvE experience, you might want to take a look at this spot. There's effectively three camps of wild paws that are the same mob type that were in the cave in the horde area, like I said, that are just on this side of the zone here. 
and they're in very, very, very high volume. Now, something else to notice here that a lot of people might not know about is that in the old AV, there was these bombs here on the ground. They're respective to your faction. So coming from this side, these are alliance. But if you come to the other side, you'll see that they do a large amount of fire damage to you. So anyway, we're just going to show off these camps. As you see, there's about like seven to ten mobs in each of them. There's one. Actually, it looks like there's four. Yeah, there's four. So if you are more than four, really, there's a lot of mobs here one way or the other. So if you're in a very high volume AOE -er, or you're just extremely tanky and you're very confident in your ability to pull this much, this is a very good place to level. If you did all four or five of these packs by themselves, uh, probably by the time you got the final pack down, the first pack might be respawning. The other problem though, again, is that you're pretty close to where the battle might take place. So there's a lot of potential EXP sharing that might go on without you uh, even realizing it. But while we're here, we're also going to take a look at another kind of hidden quest that a lot of people probably don't even know exists or was ever in the game in the first place. And again, this is just near the first camp that we just showed there. But if you come up this little mountain here, you'll see a exclamation point on your map. And it takes you into this little cave here, which is very bizarre, definitely a little different than normal. And this gives Master Ryson's all-seeing eye. This is a quest to pick up an object on uh, the floor of a cave, which we're now going to go and show. I don't know if it actually gives gives experience. Is it worth doing? Uh, no, it gives no experience, but it does give 10 time walking badges. So this time we're basically on the exact opposite side of the map as we were checking out the gnolls. It is over here with these Winterax trolls. Now this is a very famous addition in Korak's Revenge because it is, of course, Korak himself comes from this tribe of trolls. And this does lead to a cave, which uh, is going to be covered by elites. So again, these mobs are very valuable to kill. If you can come and kill these, me and Cop again had great success here. Two manning it is pretty easy. Uh, they are elites, but you can pull one at a time without much issue. The object is just right there on the ground. Looks like somebody's already picked it up this battle, but it would be right here on the ground if it was here. You can pick it up uh, under any circumstances, even if you're in combat. It's a small channel to get it. But the big problem here is that uh, you have to get out. And you only have a few minutes. Uh, it's a, it puts a buff on you that basically uh, indicates that you've picked up the item. And the item itself allows you to see stealth. Uh, turning it in gives you a buff for the, for the whole group that does the same thing. But the problem is any damage taken or basically you know any anything that you do like if you stealth yourself or uh, whatever else you know it's going to drop this buff so it's a huge pain to get this item back you would pretty much need a full team of people to come in here or at least uh, you know two to three to help clear this place out because you, you have very little time to get back and you you certainly can't be afforded in any, any time to fight these mobs on the way out so one of the most important things about this new Alteric Valley is something that a lot of people seem to overlook, and that is the NPCs in the actual valley itself. And one of the most important ones are the captains, and this is Captain Gabalgar and Captain Belinda, two famous characters who obviously you would know if you did the original AV, but these mobs are often overlooked in the Korax Revenge because people think they're just not worth killing, and a lot of that reason is because in the old AV, you would get a ton of reinforcements taken off from the team. But with no reinforcements, people don't think it's worth it. This is definitely not the case, as these captains actually provide a huge buff for the opponent, opposing team every once in a while. So just doing this alone is going to give a ton of experience, and it's definitely worth doing. But another thing to point out is that if we, as Alliance, kill Galvagar while... Belinda is still alive, she automatically gives us her buff. So again, you'll see it, you know, Alliance just lost her, but uh, you'll see it as Horde and Alliance very often. A lot of times people, uh, they don't actually kill her or him. They just ride by them and leave them up the whole time. Missing out on a ton of experience and potentially giving the enemy team a great buff with which to swing a battle. So if you're in here looking to win, I would definitely recommend trying to convince your team to find a good time to kill these bosses. They have a lot of health and they're going to take a lot of work to kill. You're not really going to be able to go in there with the group of five like you might in the new AV. You're really going to need at least 10 to 15, 20 people. You want a bloodlust. You want to have a tank in there, uh, especially a tank who could taunt the boss to put the debuff on it to make it die even faster. And you're really going to want to spend a lot of resources on killing these bosses so if it's not the right time it's not the right time it's not always a good time to send 20 some people into a pve event in this battleground but just think about that because you know you're going to get a lot of experience and it's also going to help the team win
Another semi-reliable source of EXP per hour, but also more important rewards are going to be these new NPCs that just ambushed me right there that are not in the original AV, and it's probably one of the most noticeable things about the new uh, Korax Revenge Battleground. But, you know, you could technically farm them for experience as well, but the main thing they do is they give uh, these, uh, you know, objects that you might want, uh, and they're controlled by these mobs called Lieutenants. So there's too many Lieutenants to list, but the main thing you'll notice here is we're in front of Gavagar, and there's two Lieutenants. And both of them have buffs that uh, make killing them and the mobs around them a lot harder. Uh, the main thing that these lieutenants do besides buff the mobs is they also are responsible for the respawns. So if you kill every single lieutenant on the map, let's say, then that will mean there is just no more NPCs on the map after you kill them the first time. And there's a lot of NPCs now, especially in some of these little hubs here almost. Uh, you know, we've seen these pats here that can cause a lot of problems. Even if you just get dismounted by them, they're a problem, but they do a lot of damage. There's, of course, uh, you know, big camps of them as well. And this camp especially is one that is guarding uh, two different objectives for the horde side. You know, you could also try to farm them for these scraps, which we got at least some of. So um, let's talk a little bit about the scraps. So the armor scraps is now um, another uh, really good way to get time warped badges. Uh, it's still a daily, I believe, but doing this once a day is a very good way to get some badges if you're still after only the mount, and it's also a good way to get some experience. Also, it allows you to upgrade your units, right? And this is a very important part of this battle as well, because all those NPCs we were just talking about, you actually, uh, you know, you could impact how strong they are based on turning in these armor scraps. So luckily, I came here at the right time. You will see the dialogue that allows you to upgrade them if there's full. Otherwise, you'll see this dialogue. Uh, he'll be talking about basically the same type of thing we talked about earlier where it's a couple dialogues that indicate just how filled they are. Instead, there should be a bar, but obviously this is old stuff, so that's not going to happen. But you're also going to get a ton from killing players. And, and killing players is probably the easiest way to get them, but the problem is only one person can loot the corpse. So killing a player and then looting the corpse is the way you're going to get it. You're going to get this and a lot of other stuff as well. So if you have a ton of armor scraps, make sure you come and turn them in and then, you know, check on the upgrade process. Eventually, you know if the battle goes for like a half hour or an hour or something like that it's pretty obvious that you're gonna have the cap on you can only upgrade them three times either way that's a very important thing to do here especially now that it's a daily for even experience so uh, another great thing that you could do is uh, summon Ivis all right so let's talk a little bit about Ivis and uh, lock the um, the rock elemental for horde equivalents here they're very unique mobs and of course Turning in these things is a very good thing to do. I, that didn't give experience. That was just a coincidence. That was the trickle experience. But you do want to get this thing summoned at least once per battle. Now, I've been told that if you summon him, there's a chance to summon him again. I think it's within an hour or two hours. I don't know if people were trolling or what. But realistically, you're only going to have one chance at summoning this guy. Okay? And it takes a lot of work to do it. But in, once it's done, it could make a huge, huge swing. You could turn, turn in these uh, Storm Crystals as Alliance or these little vials of blood as Horde. So apparently it's actually 500 of these crystals. I don't know for sure, but that's what people are saying on the internet. Either way, it's a lot. It's going to require a lot of people contributing to it. But once you've contributed enough and it's time to move, this actual NPC is going to move throughout the battleground. And something that you could keep in mind here is that you'll be able to see her based on this, this actual thing on the map here. Okay, this is the only actual quest icon in the entire map. There's not any other one. It's going to be her positioning effectively and i don't know if they did this on purpose or it's some kind of bug but it's very useful to keep a track of because she is going to run from here all the way to down here and you'll then need to have 10 people there to summon ivis and all 10 people need to channel on a rock that's down there and once they do they will summon ivis but let's talk a little bit about when and why you should summon ivis okay so a lot of people are probably just in love with the concept of summoning ivis like as soon as they can but you don't want to do that just willy-nilly okay the reason is Ivis and, and the equivalent on Horde, they're going to just run in a straight line. They're not going to fight any NPCs. They're only going to fight players until they get to their endpoint. And for Ivis, the endpoint is right outside of Drex Keep, okay? And getting there is a feat on its own. Obviously, you can heal him. You can also buff him with things like, you know, the Druid Mark of the Wild buff from PvP Towns, uh, Rep Pally uh, Kings, etc. You can put these big, or, uh, yeah, like these big buffs on him that do exist in the game. And you can also heal him. Healing him is a huge, huge deal. For him to get all the way from here, 
Well, you know, effectively from here all the way south is not going to be an easy thing for him to do on his own. So the reason you don't want to just summon him randomly is because if you're following him, supporting him, there's a good chance a lot of people are going to die. So if we summon him right now, which, you know, it's not going to happen, but it's possible, he would have to go through all of this area here, which we have no territory in. We have no graveyards. We have no towers. He would be a very easy target for the Horde. And this is the number one mistake I see if you're trying to win is not using the NPCs well. And there's a lot of NPC summons, and we're going to talk about that, but... Ivis is the tier one, number one summon. All right. And again, the equivalent locker or whatever the dude's name is on Horde. Extremely important that you use them at the right time. If you do not, they're just basically going to suicide. They're going to continue to run with or without you next to them. And you are going to die while they do. And you're going to respawn all the way up here. And that is going to make it so you cannot keep up with them. And they are effectively fodder. If you have, you know, 30 plus people down there attacking them and you're not stopping them from doing it, he's going to die extremely quick, and that was your best chance to push and win. If you have Ice Blood and Frost Wolf Graveyard, then it is time to summon Ivis, because Ivis is going to allow you to break any kind of turtle. That's really when you want to do it. You want to do it when they're now in a turtle defensive position. The last thing to do is capture Frost Wolf Relief Hut, and you win. They're blocking you from doing that because of all the NPCs in the base and all the other stuff. That's when you summon Ivis. That's when you summon other NPCs. So right on cue, they have actually summoned their Ivis equivalent, Lock Halar, the Ice Lord, and he is gonna pretty they pretty much do the same thing. I mean, they have like some range attacks. Really, Ivis is probably slightly better because he he roots, uh, he does like this chain root ability. They've summoned him in a, a pretty uh, awkward position. He's gonna struggle to get much done in this position, and a lot of the alliance are probably gonna be able to repel a lot of the horde uh, actual players here. So it's a very difficult thing to actually get past here. This guy is gonna cause havoc. And uh, even though I said they probably should have waited until they got the graveyard, they are actually, you know, they didn't get the graveyard. We got it back. So this is actually a great teaching moment here where if we were able to wipe them and, uh, you know, like wipe a good portion of them, they would summon, they would spawn all the way back here. And that would mean that this guy was basically defenseless. He was here on his own, just kind of single targeting people down while we're all crushing him. And he was just die. And that, that could be the reason they lose this battleground. In fact, it looks like it's happening pretty, uh, it's getting pretty close to happening right now. So here you see the fallen Ice Lord and probably their hopes of getting a quick victory on the Horde side out of the window. So let's talk about Horde NPC placements then as obviously very different from Alliance. In fact, one of the main things you'll see here is that the Horde actually starts up here, which is not where it starts in what AV is now. It starts obviously back here. But yeah, the Horde starts up here. And then there's this little area here. This is where the Ram, uh, you know, the thing we were talking about before with the Rams and stuff, you're going to want to kill Rams this time instead of tame them. And you're going to want to tame Wolves instead. And these two quests, again, require 25 of each. And then it'll allow you to summon the Cavalry. So the layout of the base is a little different here. It's one of the main quest givers. This is, of course, the Armor Smith person, who, again, now these are daily, so... You'll want to get them going, and you'll want to do them on any character you're leveling on every day. Uh, here's the Primalist area, so this is where you'll be turning in any Bloods to summon Lokalar. And most importantly, the Quartermaster is in a pretty out-of-the-way spot. It's actually behind this little tower here. And as we pass this tower, you're going to see Yazra Bloodsnarl, who is the target of the Quartermaster when you uh, complete enough, turn enough boxes in. Again, either 30 of the close turn in or 5 of the far turn in with some combination of the two equaling enough, uh, you will see that um, you will get recommended to go to Yazra Bloodsnarl. So she is just right out in front of that tower. Pretty common NPC to die. The Alliance one is right in front of one of the bunkers, but this is like to even get to the towers that you have to burn, you have to pass through this area right here. So all of these NPCs, pretty common that they end up dying, but realistically, none of them are really that important, so. Battle's well underway, but I still like to farm and make sure that we get at least the cavalry out there. So let's talk a little bit about the cavalry now. I really like doing it as a stealthy because you can pretty much just stealth past any players or NPCs and just come up here around here and farm 
uh, what you need for it. And the good thing about doing it as Horde, which we are right now, is that even when like their commandos or you know their players are in our base, they're never really going to be watching this area over here. This area is very far away because if the base is under siege, you can still make a pretty nice little play here by getting this commando situation dealt with. So uh, people usually do the wolves for you. I'm not sure if they would have today, but I do actually have 25 of these to turn in. So I'm going to pick up this and do this real quick. And this is as easy as it gets, really. You just go over here and, uh, you know, put a muzzle on these wolves. This was another really popular way to farm the mount. And I don't, I know they changed some things. I don't really know if people are still going to be doing it, but um, it's still a very valuable part of the battle. Like, Summer, summoning the cavalry is extremely important. All right, looks like we're done here. So another tip that you might want to be aware of is uh, that you cannot actually turn this in if the wolf is too far away. So it's just something to keep in mind. If you're doing this for whatever reason and you want the wolf uh, to be turned in, make sure you, it's actually with you. Sometimes you'll get one from really far away and you'll mount up and by the time uh, you get there, the wolf will still be really far away. You'll turn it in and it'll just bug out and the wolf will just kind of stay with you forever. Uh, that's not a good thing, so you'll have to die to fix that. But anyway, uh, provided you do this right, 25 of each, which again, we had plenty of, yeah, we still have a lot to turn in, but we had plenty of, we got 25 of these. But like I said, pretty easy to farm. It's literally just low level PVE effectively. But the big problem is if you're up there, you might be getting attacked by people. As you're seeing, I'm actually getting a lot of rep, but most of it is not with uh, this, the Frost Wolf Clan, which is what we would want it with. But we are getting a fair amount of rep for this. I mean, turning 25 of these in, for two rep a piece is gonna add up to 50 rep a total, so it could add up, but. Okay, so unleash the cavalry. Now, this is pretty cool to be fair. I love watching this happen, even if uh, it's not the most effective thing in the game. Yeah, let's take a look at the path that they would take. Oh, also one thing that you can do is you can buff them, which is really nice as a druid because we have guardian of the, uh, or mark of the wild, I'm sorry. Buff on all of them, which just reduces the damage they'll take from AOE, but effectively, uh, you know, it might help a little bit. So. Yeah, they'll take a route from all the way here, all the way to, uh, yeah, about here-ish, okay, right right south of the, um, yeah, let's see if we could actually do something here, actually, now that I think about it. It's gonna be right next to Korak, though. Are they gonna actually do anything? Looks like they don't care about NPCs either, so I have seen them fight NPCs, but yeah, there we go. Typically, you kind of have to goad them into it, and I'm not really sure why that's the case. <laughs> but yeah, obviously, uh, you don't want to get hit by these mobs, especially as a... Oh, look at that. He's going to fight the wolf now. So that's kind of cool. So we actually just got a free graveyard because of these things. Not that it's that important, but um, yeah, they were able to take the... There's multiple ways to do this, by the way, but they were able to take the mobs away and uh, effectively kill them as well, and I could now cap the graveyard for that. So... There's another good way if you're looking for get the graveyard quest done every day. Uh, that's a good way to do it. And then obviously loot the corpses. So, All right, anyway, let's try to keep up with them. They're moving pretty fast, but they're hopefully not going to run into any resistance. Actually, that would probably be a good thing if they did. It is pretty cool when they um, they ride in this this straight line like this, and then there's just some <laughs> some ally just kind of just kind of unknowingly rides right into them. That is an awesome. I, I tell you, that is some of the coolest things that could happen in the game, man. I love it. I really do. It's so cool. The, these NPCs are the reason why I love AV. And, uh, you know, I don't know what actually exists and what doesn't exist anymore in the, the real AV. But it's just really nice seeing this, you know, be a part of the game again. So, uh, yeah, it looks like the same thing might happen here if we were able to make that a thing. But um, we don't really care too much. Looks like they're going to actually attack them on their own. So that's good. We'll uh, just ca cap this real quick. But yeah, same deal here. They're just going to kill pretty much anything that comes in, in their path, I guess, including NPCs as well. And uh, they're pretty powerful as a unit. Let's put it that way. I'll tell you that. If you uh, if you see them running towards you as an alliance, get out of the way. Because even though they're, yeah, Horde's NPCs, for some reason, just seem slightly weaker than alliances. And partially because the ground assault is, itself is bugged. Um, but... It is pretty common that you just see some ally ride right into these and not realize what they are and just get the demolished. But the allies are so far advanced at this point. I'm surprised they haven't won yet, but they're about to win, I'd imagine. Anyway, yeah, they would like ride back here for a while until you basically told them that they needed to go do something else. There would be, uh, yeah, here it is, actually. Uh, oh, no, 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 this is actually him. Yeah, this is the guy I was talking about. Uh, I guess he somehow got out ahead of the actual riders themselves. But they'll go around the back, as you see there. They're going around the back now. 
And if you had enough rep, let's kill this mob quick. If you had enough rep, you'd be able to talk to this guy and you'd be able to send them uh, towards the north, basically, instead. So he says, awaiting orders from my superiors. I can't do it on this character because I am not high enough rep, but I believe it is honored. Yeah, so if you have enough rep, you could send them north. And then they're, they're a pretty strong force. But again, you really got to pick and choose your battles with them because if they die, that's pretty much it, right? I don't think you could send them a second time. I'm, I'm fairly certain. So yeah, you got to be careful with that. But anyway, that's it for the cavalry. And just from the Alliance side here, as you see, the cavalry actually is just kind of on the opposite side of the valley. Horde was on this side. Alliance is on this side. They're kind of just going to ride. It, this is actually a much better location, though, compared to where they were on Horde. Honestly, they, they would have a much higher impact from this location. And then if you're looking to move them south, make them push, you would talk to this guy here. Stormpike Ram Commander. Again, awaiting orders from my superior. Don't have the necessary rep, but he's right here next to this giant steam engine or whatever this thing is from uh, Warcraft 3. So let's talk now about the aerial support summon the wing commanders and how they interact with that. So there's three wing commanders for each team and somehow all three of them have been captured deep behind enemy lines. I'm going to show you the locations for all three now, but you need to understand that not only do you have to find them, but you have to get them back to the base safely. Now there's obviously times when that's more appropriate than other times, like when you're just pushed all the way north and there's nobody going to be anywhere in the, in the middle of them, but they do have a fair amount of health and they will generally survive pretty well on their own as long as they do not run into the enemy Zerg. So here is the first one for Horde. This is absolutely the easiest one to get out of all six. It is up here by this weird little lumber area. I don't really know why this is even here, but yeah, it's just up here on this path. I was able to stealth to it, no problem. There are some stealth sight uh, owls here uh, padding. Yeah, there you see those owls over there. They have stealth sight, but one way or the other, I'm not gonna actually do this because if I did, it would just die to the NPCs. In fact, actually, maybe it's worth seeing just how it handles the NPCs, but this is Jestor, the easiest one. And again, why you're summoning and why you're getting these back to the base is because they have a turn in that you're really going to want to do. It effectively uh, allows you to summon a aerial unit, a mob that flies well above the battleground and just kind of circles and throws like stuns and range damage onto targets, usually in the middle, uh, I'm pretty sure exclusively in the middle, the fields of strife area. So if there's any actual battling going on anywhere near here, it would be very good to have these uh, flying units here. So let's just take a look for science's sake. What's going to happen against our good friend? And, uh, wing commander Jester. She actually ran right through those NPCs, so that's unique. Let's see how um, how much we could follow her with stealth here, just just to see what happens. But yeah, it's going to be interesting. I, she might run through these again as well. Let's see. Uh, I won't go down there just because I'll end up aggroing them. But yeah, ideally you wouldn't do you wouldn't summon her like this. You would probably wait. Yeah, so she ran right through them, and uh, looks like they aggro now because probably the NPC aggroed. But uh, let's see if we can sneak by and keep keep up. Should be able to now that they've aggroed to her. Yeah, so she's going to fight them. But yeah, so this is a very important mob type. And uh, obviously, you want to get them back if you get all three back. Uh, then anyway, there's a new, you know, a new turn in and it's uh, I don't actually have any of the items currently but yeah it's a um, storm pike flesh there's a variety of different things variety of different items that you could turn into any of the three it will say it on the item yeah here's some of it uh, storm pike soldiers blood let's see uh, yeah return to goose back to fuel and areas anyway um, obtaining a beacon is going to be what you do next so once they're back in base the wing commanders will accept a certain type of metal and flesh depending on which wing commander they are and once they have handle, uh, handed in enough of whatever they want, you'll be able to do two things. First thing is obtain a beacon, which must be placed somewhere on the field of strife and protected for one minute. After this minute is up, a bat rider or a griffin rider, depending on faction, will come and fly around the field of strife. You can get these for each wing commander and having three of these around the battlefield battering the enemy is a huge advantage. You could tell the wing commander to attack, which uh, he slash she will mount up on her bat griffin depending on the faction and will also apparently uh, fly out so um yeah i guess that's a yet another thing to do there so so here you can actually see one of the wing commanders mounts or whatever you want to call that that is actually one that was spawned like the npc itself is technically on that mount even though you can't see it there's not actually any horde here but if there were he'd be flying over i believe he'd be stunning them throwing fire damage at them but uh, you can do each of these for each wing commander, so there's no sense in telling a wing commander to attack before you've gotten a beacon from her. 
Also note that the wing commander is out flying, then there is no use whatsoever for her, his or her specific flesh or metal, so you can safely destroy it. So once they're out there, I guess they're good for uh, out there for good. It's a very rare thing. Typically, I'd want to show you in the video, but it's a very rare thing for it to happen. Sadly, I can't. Um, I can't rely on getting these things back and then everybody doing all of this. So, But that's something to be aware of. Uh, I, I am going to show you the other locations of them, but that's something to be aware of if you get them back and they're up. Just check. I'll show that uh, spot where they're normally at too. But just check and make sure if they're there. Um, you never know. You join a one in progress. Somebody might have already done it. So here's another one. Got to make quick work of it though. Gues is here as well. Uh, so this is this is where Wing Commander uses. This is Ice Wing Bunker. It's actually really close to where uh, Jez, whatever Jester was. She's just in here. And of course, uh, again, you're not really going to want to do this when there's tons of NPCs around. But uh, basically, I guess if you can get both of these out at the same time, they like if you went and did Jestor first and then immediately came here for Gues, the two of them might actually be able to help each other get south. So that's a pretty good option. So, And let's go find the final one, which is well behind enemy lines. And the final one here is Wing Commander Mulverk. And this is, of course, in the north bunker the dumbbell dar north bunker so again way behind enemy lines here and uh, again really wouldn't recommend doing what i'm about to do but you never know get them out probably better to get them out than not get them out right so uh, we'll see what happens probably not going to make it there but anyway let's go i'll show you the location of where they would get if they made it there so if any of them did make it which obviously they didn't based on how i opened them but yeah they would be right here the three of them would be around this area you'd be able to talk to them you'd be able to uh, interact with their dialogues and uh, you know potentially turn stuff in turn the different materials in and like i said you'll be able to either put the beacon down which is you know i i, I don't know I'm, i haven't really seen it work properly but I guess it works. And then obviously, uh, if you get those summons out into the middle of the field, that'd be good. So let's take a look now at the Alliance positions. So here we have Wing Commander Vipor. This is, of course, one of the Alliance Wing Commanders. I'm still on the Horde tune, but you'll still be able to see them. And this is in, what was this random hut in the middle of the Frost Wolf area? And this is, if you were to draw parallels, this would be equivalent to this one. The Jestor, the first one we took a look at, who was just kind of in the middle of nowhere. Like, I'm not even sure why this area is up there, honestly. Really just for flavor. So this is a huge difference here. Getting into this part of the base is so much harder than getting into that lumber mill area as a horde. So this is obviously, you know, Alliance is going to have a much harder time getting all three of these guys back. Here is Wing Commander Ickman. This is, a, again, in the horde base. It is on the tower that is... You know, uh, to the left here, West Frostwolf Tower, and Wing Commander Ickman is in that. Just like in Dunbeldar North, pretty much the other two are at least parallel. It's just that first one that's really in a weird spot. And the final one's in Tower Point here, but it does look like there was just a battle. You'd be here on, uh, pr pretty sure the first floor, maybe it's above, but no. I'm pretty sure it's on the first floor, just kind of sitting here. Uh, and uh, obviously... You know, he's dead for this one, or he's been already been summoned for this one. So let's see if we can go find him in his actual location. Okay, so very dangerous, precarious position here as a horde, even in stealth. Uh, but yeah, you could actually see one of them over here, um, Wing Commander Sildor. So this is where they would be for alliances. Alliance actually got one back, which is weird because I just, uh, <laughs> we just made the, the video on it, and this guy's already back. So that's good. That must have been the one from Tower Point. But anyway, so that's where they would be. Uh, same deal for Alliance. You turn in, like, so I have some of these items here. Storm Pike, Soldier Flesh, very odd looking icons as well. Uh, definitely not. I mean, that's not flesh. That's that, Those are like lungs or something. But anyway, yeah, you would turn in an equivalent here for Alliance and the exact same things would happen. Uh, you'd be able to uh, get um, the, the airstrike and uh, potentially talk to them. But you can also come here as Horde and just kill them outright one way or the other. But that's uh, that's everything you need to know about the Wing Commanders and the Aerial Assault. The mines themselves have been a hot topic for many reasons, but they are still an important thing to control as we've talked about earlier in the video. And uh, the way that you actually control them is by killing the NPCs in them. Now, at first they start out like this where there's just a ton of uh, neutral NPCs or NPCs that aren't Horde or Alliance is more what I mean. And once uh, you you know clear enough of them out, there is going to be an area here where there's a named NPC. So we're going to show that off as well. But there's actually a fair amount of mobs in here. So uh, doing it this way is probably not the most ideal way to do it. In fact, I think the best way to do it would simply be to stealth, come as a stealth class and just kind of get by all these mobs and get right to the action with the named mob as that's the only thing you have to do. If you were able to do that, you'd be able to kill the named mob it would automatically capture it for your faction 
and you would get uh, the, the mine done immediately, filling up your version of the mine with all of your faction's NPCs, who would then come in and actually fight the rest of the NPCs who are here from when it was not controlled by you. So it's a very cool concept. But as you see, here is Morlock. This is the Trog leader, effectively, of the mine. And once we kill him, he will uh, not respawn, and we will immediately capture the mine. So this is actually how you get credit for completing this quest, which is something a lot of people probably aren't actually aware of in order to capture there's no flag or nothing that you need to do but you kill him and then as you see the mine is going to fill up with iron deep miners if you're alliance here it's going to fill up with npcs on our side long story short and they're going to kill the remainder of the npcs here and uh, 90 percent of the, i've never actually seen them lose any of these battles it seems like you know some of them get kind of uh, gained up on but for the most part, if you just left this alone for a while, you would come back here and you would have the mine uh, come fully controlled. And one other thing to mention is that once you have controlled the mine, it'll apparently be yours for one full hour before the Trogs return to retake it. But of course, as Horde and Alliance, you can capture each other's mines. And as we mentioned earlier, the main reason you want to do that is because the boxes that spawn in there can be turned in so if you actually went and got the horde one which would be a very good idea it looks like somebody's actually trying to do that right now in this game if you went there especially with maybe like two stealthies you can probably easily capture it and uh you know early in the game there's probably going to be a lot of people in there regardless of what they changed but yeah just capturing it and getting even one or two rounds from the opposite base are going to dramatically improve your ability to turn in the quests here to get what you need but as you see capture in mind 17k experience obviously scaled up 26k so very good idea to start the battle with that every time if you and now that it's a daily especially the dial here we have enough supplies to launch ground assaults if you're standing with storm pike guard is high enough then speak with norag so again norag's right over here he gives you these plans where are they here they are. It's a 15 minute CD though, or duration. Okay, so you only have 15 minutes to get them there. So if you die a bunch on the way, or he's not up for some reason, which he should always be up whenever you have enough supplies, I believe. Here's the location of Field Marshal Terravain. As well, again, you would turn the Storm Pike assault orders into this guy as long as you have the appropriate rep to get them. And the Horde equivalent is in the camp over there, and that's just south of. The graveyard, Snowfall Graveyard, it would be in this camp here. I think I did show it in a previous part of the video, but yeah, it would be over there. In fact, I think it's that guy there, Warmaster Garrick. Yeah, that's the guy. Called Commandos for Alliance and Reavers for Horde, and they are extremely potent. But one thing to notice is that for Horde, it does seem to be bugged, at least the last time I did it. Um, they only summon the first time with the, the full set of Reavers, and then after that, they don't actually... Yeah, they're there, they're there. So anyway, as uh, as Horde, they don't um they don't seem to work. If you do them more than once in the battleground, they only only the main guy is actually there. So you see, these things are just gonna absolutely cut a swath through the battle. These things are even more powerful, I feel like, than the actual Horde equivalent and uh, the, even the cavalry too, right? I think these ones are just overpowered, honestly. I've never seen these things do anything but wreak absolute havoc. So they're about to hit real hard. And watch what happens. They just tear an absolute hole in this battleground. Oh, boy. That guy is... Oh, my God. <laughs> that guy is toast. See, that's the best moment, dude. I'm telling you. That's why I love... That's why I would really recommend playing a, a Death Knight in this. Because you can grip people into this. How you counter these mobs is kite them into Drek. It's very difficult to get Drek to attack them. But it is possible, and it's very devastating. Like, that's it. Like, if you, if Drek fights them, he will kill them. No matter how strong they are, he is much stronger. So, anyway, that's that. That's using commandos extremely well is uh, more important than pretty much anything else in the in the battleground. Uh, the NPCs in general. Using the NPCs well is pretty much more important than anything in the battleground. Towers are another very important part of AV, but that's not actually different from the old AV, the original AV, that being not Korak's Revenge. You still needed to get these towers, and the main reasons you want to get these four towers is because they each provide a NPC and buff to the respective boss, so we're trying to get the Horde Tower right now, and if we do successfully destroy this tower, we will destroy one of the major NPCs and buffs given to Drek'thar, basically making all four, uh, once all four are down, making it possible to finish it. There's been a lot of times where you can kill it with two, maybe one up especially. But one way or the other, what is different in Core Extra Venture is that there's these commander NPCs attached to the tower. And a, lo a lot of, you know, just a lot of NPCs in general are 
uh, things that are going to be blocking your progression here. So again, you're not really going to be able to come up here and just take this on your own like you might have in the past. And it's going to take a lot longer to do. As you see here, by the time we kill this commander, we're going to have all the horde returning to try to re, uh, you know, recap it. So as you see there, actually a perfect timing. We got 6k for the trickle and 12 and a half K for the capture of the tower here. So this is actually a great, uh, a great, a great example of why it's a very good idea to capture these towers, even if you know, even if you're not uh, thinking about killing the boss anytime soon. Just getting the towers and getting things like Gavilgar or Belinda, whatever the captains down, is a huge source of experience as well. And the final thing we want to take a look at today is how a low level operates in this battleground, because a lot of people have been talking about that. You know, low levels are really uh, not worth doing this on at all. And I think the reason that that might be the case is not actually that the battleground gives poor experience, but just that so many other things in the game might give more. So, uh, you know, when your level, so say like you were to get like, you know, 3% of a level every two minutes. Well, you can probably beat that out in the world, right? Like that's not very good when you're level 20, but when you're level 110 or something like that, then that's actually great. Like that's really good, you know what I mean? So uh, the one good thing I'll say about, uh, you know, low level characters is that you're gonna get full experience for mining, which, uh, you know, <laughs> 844 experience, that's a lot, right? So uh, the other big problem is though, of course, you have very limited gear and not everybody's trying to maximize their character in these, but. Uh, you know, it would be a very good idea to have a, a very well maximized character in here, especially if you were going to level. So um, typically what it seems like you want is a lot of sockets. Uh, people were talking about just doing a full clear of Sunwell and maybe even Black Temple or something like that. Just getting as many pieces with sockets as possible and then coming in here with those with gems and stuff because the gems, uh, you know, they don't scale down or I'm not exactly sure how it works, but Basically, the gems are a good way to do it. So, you know, I actually just ding there and uh, hey, that's that's pretty good, right? So, yeah, so we just got a trickle of 325 experience. That's very low, even if, you know, whatever else is considered, that is actually only 0.5% of the level. So I, I don't know if the substantiated claim of 3% is actually substantiated. Everybody keeps saying 3% every two minutes. I don't know exactly how that works whether or not that's based on a certain level or whether or not that's even true, the whole two minutes thing. But, you know, let's just turn some of the other stuff in just, just to show um, perhaps how little or how much we get actually, you know. So the quartermaster quest actually gives less experience than it says it should as well. Um, I don't know exactly what's causing that, but like you might do these quests and you might see, like we did actually see, see that in the previous um, part of the video, whereas we're, tu we're turning in this quest and uh, we're getting no you know, we're getting a lot more experience than we should on some tunes, like on our the, the dwarf uh, warrior that was 116. We actually had, I think it was 28K instead of 18K from the quest. So that, that's a lot, right? That's a big difference. But on this character, we actually got less than the quest that we were supposed to get. So I don't know how that's being calculated, but so you probably want to get him to about 60. I've been doing it on level 60-ish and it's not too bad. It feels about the same rate as the 110s, maybe slightly slower, but yeah, I think around level 60 is when you might want to start doing this. Another thing that has been talked about, which we're going to check out here today, is the possibility of getting the Korak, the Blood Rager quest done outside of the battleground. In case you guys don't know, Korak, the Blood Rager is actually the last boss of the Amphitheater of Anguish. This is in the Zoldrag zone in Northrend. And uh, obviously it might be difficult to do this on a lower level character, but it's very easy to do this on any higher level character. So, uh, so the crowd's hyped. Here comes Korak making his triumphant return from AV after a, a, a couple months of slaughter there. So we'll show how it works out and uh, yeah, you'll see that I get through. Of course, in order to turn the quest in, you have to be in AV, right? I'm pretty sure so. Uh, yeah, you're not actually gonna be able to do that. Hailing from the distant mountains of Alterac, one of the fiercest competitors this arena has ever seen, Korak the Blood Rager. So it's a pretty cool little, you know, thing that they did here. This is one of the things that I love about Blizzard is they always manage to make little Easter eggs within their own game from their own game. <laughs> so no graveyard here for you to play wicked games on Korak. Yeah, obviously, uh, you know, he's talking about that. But as you see, I got both done. Either way, quest is done. So if you really want to do it that way, you can. I think it's also important to note that 
items like inky black potion do actually affect av and even though you're probably going to die a lot and have to use a lot of these they can actually improve visibility on the map as well you can see these giant red pillars coming up this means that horde control these objectives respectively and you know alliance control the ones that you see so it's actually kind of useful i mean not super useful to do but you could also use shade scale as well and do uh, something similar it's not obviously the same effect but i think av looks really good at night so i don't mind using these when i can and the final thing we're going to talk about here today is probably one of the most obscure things in the whole battle, which is obviously part of AV uh, classic mode, right? Uh, it is Master Engineer Zin Fizzlick. So if anybody wants to go down a rabbit hole, type this guy's name into Google and follow all the different trails that you might find with this guy. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about this, okay? So he is at the cave, the mouth of the cave, right across from uh, this graveyard here, whatever, the snowfall or whatever. And he's surrounded by all these elite trolls, okay? So how this works is the first team to get to him gets him to run to their base now i'm pretty sure that if i talk to him right now he's just gonna run and die to all of these trolls but we're gonna find out <laughs> but more so let's talk about the quest he gives before we suicide and do that okay so he gives a quest that is called zin Physilix portable shredder unit okay it requires apparently i think these might actually be wrong because this is on wowhead but i'm it requires a lot of materials. Let's put it this way. Yeah, you know, this is right. 75 iron bars, 50 mithril bars, and 30 thorium bars. This is a lot of materials that you need. And then you also need one steam saw. So the steam saw is something that's actually located in AV. And apparently there's two locations for it. If you're horde... Uh, so I don't know if this is true or not, but it seems like if you're a horde and you get this guy, then you have to go into alliance territory to get the steam saw. And if you're alliance and you get this guy, you have to go into horde territory. It might be the opposite, but I don't know because I'm not going to turn in 75 iron bars worth of stuff just to see. But the steam saws are apparently here. So the one that's in Alliance territory, again, whether or not Alliance or Horde have to pick that up, pretty sure it'd probably be Horde, is here somewhere, okay? I don't know exactly where, but they say it's uh, near the lumber. I think it might, might even be in that hunt, that hut near um, the Wing Commander. I don't know. But it's up here in that lumber mill area. That makes sense. And the Horde one is just south of the Ice Blood Graveyard, which you might actually be able to... Let's see if we can see it real quick. Yep, yeah, you can see it right there. So you see that lumber truck there? It's apparently... It would be right there if you had uh, the quest it's a very 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 obscure i mean this is really complicated stuff to even get this quest done but then apparently what it does is it summons a portable shredder unit for apparently how it works is it summons some kind of thing that you use and whether or not it's actually does damage or not like let's see some of the comments here uh three day in-game cooldown not three days real life apparently so you can actually get a lot of use out of this uh, i don't people are saying it as a long cd um, no, it's a three day period of time that it lasts. That's what it is. And it's a 45 minute cooldown. So you're going to get to use it like once per battle. Um, and it lasts until it dies. It's a controlled, uh, it is controlled through the shredder's eyes. So people are saying it's like a channeled mind control type control and you get it. And I, I don't know what it does. Does it just do damage? Who knows? Let's go goblin. So is he going to, let's get back to your base. Is he going to actually, now when you talk, when you hit these guys, they actually run right for you so that's a lot of uh, a lot of mobs here but he seems to just be being ignored by them so let's see if we could find him i guess i mean where are we gonna res oh we're gonna res right here this is perfect ideal scenario let's see oh he's just walking right through everything okay so that's really cool so yeah you can do this stealth so apparently once he gets to the graveyard then he starts sprinting made it to the graveyard yeah now he says double time i assume that means he's about to start sprinting so we go to stag form and follow him well he's made it through the whole way without any issue there was no not even a single horde player that we even saw let alone any npcs or anything so yeah i don't know if he probably would have aggroed so again this is probably just an ideal situation here but i assume he's gonna stop here and uh, then we'll get the quest from him but you know i think it's probably useful to have this quest i don't know if it goes away it's one of those quests that i think it might yeah you might have to get it every battle oh he goes in here wow Interesting. So for Horde, he goes right outside of the, the guy you turn the um, the scraps into or whatever, the armor scraps. So I, I thought he would have gone over there because that's where he goes for Horde, right outside of the armor scraps guy. But for Alliance, he goes in here. That's pretty interesting. So yeah, there you go. Uh, I'm as anxious as you are to try out a portable shredder unit, Night Elf, but I before I can make the kit, I'm going to need more materials, lots of materials. You're not lying. Let's see if we can find the steam saw real quick then since we actually got the quest. 
Okay, so we made it. It is actually here. I guess this is a confirmation that the Alliance one will be in Horde territory and that the Horde one will be in Alliance territory, although I didn't actually check the Alliance territory, so maybe it's in both. But anyway, there's the Steam Saw. It's just right here on the ground, right next to Ice Blood, like people were saying. And uh, yeah, covered by NPCs, though. So if you're coming here without stealth, you're probably going to end up having to do some fighting. And uh, that's that. We got the item, <laughs> at least so. Probably uh, doesn't stay in your bags. I don't know how it works. but And the final thing we wanted to talk about here to end the video is if you wanted to really spend a lot of time in here, what should you play? Because obviously you could effectively level any character start to finish in this battleground. Well, for me, tier one number one would be a death knight because death knights are already going to start at level 60-ish and you're already going to have the best experience per hour gained from that level onward. As we talked about earlier, the lower experience, you, like the, the sub-60, they're not really getting as much as the characters that are 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, etc. The higher you get, the more experience it seems like you get, at least per value, you know, compared to stuff outside of AV. So if you really want to spend the next, you know, month and a half in here, then I would definitely do it on a Death Knight. And you could even consider leveling characters that you might want for Heritage Armor. Sadly, this is going to be over before the patch drops. So you won't actually be able to level any of the new, uh, you know, the new Death Knight stuff that's coming with A3. But I would really recommend Death Knight for this. Now, some of the other things that you could consider. A stealth class. Uh, you've seen me play a lot of druids in this. And uh, also rogues would be really good. You can use their stealth to heavily manipulate some things like I just did there. I summoned that NPC. I got the quest from him. You could also go capture mines stealth. It's actually very easy, especially if you can do a lot of damage as these two classes. Quickly disper uh, you know, get through big objectives without having to clear all the, the NPCs and trash effectively that would lead up to them that would probably be tier two and tier three i would say it would be paladin uh, the main thing that you want to do as a paladin is holy because you can do some insane healing with the some of the pvp talents that are in the game there's two pvp talents i don't exactly remember the name of them but uh, one of them uh, it makes the makes holy light heal for a lot more and every time you heal the target uh, they get a stacking damage reduction percentage and then the other talent that would synergize really well with it is the one that makes Holy Light actually splash AoE damage off the target. So basically just spamming Holy Light, even if it's on yourself, is going to be doing an insane amount of AoE damage. And that could actually be really good if you're purely looking to level. Because as you saw earlier in the video, you might go into this cave or into these different areas and just AoE yourself on top of these mobs and you might be doing a ton of damage there and then on top of that as a healer you could actually contribute quite a lot to the battle even if you're low level i feel like healers are the things that are most important tanks very important as well though so if you had to pick one of those other three things i would say any tank that would be tier four any tank because tanks are always needed in this battleground and if you're serious about actually winning the battleground just stick with the zerg and keep those um keep taunting people that you want to target with that uh, pvp talent like we said Obviously, you'd have to be high enough level to have that. I think, you know, 40 is the lowest anyway, so you might as well get that uh, before you come in here anyway. But there's a lot of disruption abilities that tanks have, and 40 versus 40 battlegrounds, tanks are obviously going to be able to disrupt the most. And after that, it's pretty much anything you would enjoy. Any healer, obviously, is good. Maybe any range. Probably the lowest tier, you know, tier 9 or whatever, would be melee. Uh, melee in general, especially under-geared melee, are just going to get slaughtered in the big Zerg versus Zerg battles. And uh, they really can't do many of the objectives very well by themselves either, because the mobs actually do hit really hard, especially when you're lower level. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this. And again, if you have any questions or anything at all, like you're doing this for the first time and there's anything that I didn't cover or you're confused on, let me know. But hopefully I've shown you uh, pretty much all the NPC locations. So yeah, look forward to hearing what your thoughts are in the comments. And again, if you have any questions whatsoever, I will answer them. I absolutely love this AV. And uh, here's hoping that it will stick around in some capacity, maybe as a brawl, but I would love to see this in the game permanently.